everybody. I have two viewer submitted encounters to narrate for you today. They were both sent in by very nice people who are interested in having their story heard. They The first one is from a man who is now in his late 50s and he's remembering back to an episode when he was eight years old and they come across what he's pretty sure is a Bigfoot. He tells the story and he also gives a little background on some things that his family told him through the years. I think it's fascinating. The second encounter is from a woman, a single mother. I think she's a single mother. She doesn't mention a, a husband while this episode happens, who moves from Dallas to rural East Texas, where we all know there's all kind of Bigfoot activity, well-known place for Bigfoot activity. And her and her children are living out in the country by themselves, and they have a harrowing experience with a Bigfoot that I think is uh, interesting. And I really appreciate these people sending these in. So here we go. Hello, my name is Dr. I'll be 57 years old in January of 2018, and I live in Oklahoma. I am an American combat veteran, member of the VFW and DAV. I have bachelor's degrees in art and communications. My encounter happened in the summer of 1970 when I was eight years old. I don't care if you use my name because it's so long ago, and I don't think I have to worry about being ridiculed much. I don't care anyway. I'd really love to hear any more encounters people want to share from this area or Arkansas in general, since I plan to retire there. In the spring and summer of 1970, we lived in the country not far from Ozark, Arkansas. My dad worked in the oil patch and was gone at night and home during the day. It was in the early summertime. We had lived in the house for a couple of months. Our house was about a mile from a blacktop road, and we were the first house on the dirt road. One night, after my dad went to work, we had finished supper, and I was sitting out on the back porch, as I always did, listening to the cicadas and the whippoorwills. There was a bright full moon. My mom and sister were doing the dishes and talking in the kitchen, and the light was shining from the window out on the grass. There were always little toads hopping around at night, and I saw one in the grass by the light of the kitchen window. When I noticed it and looked up, there was an enormous figure standing on the other side of the fence looking at me. I hadn't noticed it before, probably because it was so close to the arch over the gate that in my mind didn't register it. The five-foot fence came up to about where the man's solar plexus would be, at the top of his chest. Add a few inches to that because the trail on the back side of the fence where he was standing was depressed a few inches lower than the fence. I would estimate that there was about three feet showing above the fence at least. I had never heard about anything like this before and I froze. We just stared at each other for three or four minutes, I guess, until my sister came out the back door and told me that our mom wanted me to come in and take a bath. I said shut up as quietly as I could and told her to look. When she saw it, she froze too. She was standing by the porch post and tried to hide behind it. After another couple of minutes, my mom came out and griped at me to take a bath when my sister, who was now whimpering, pointed to the creature. When my mom saw it, she freaked out and grabbed both of us and dragged us into the house, locking the door. The last look I got was the creature turning toward the field. The moon provided enough light for me to see the outline clearly. Its hair blew a bit in the light breeze and I could see it clearly on the shoulders. It was more obvious when it turned and the hair was displaced. It was about six inches long, I would guess. There was a yard light on the opposite side of the house and when it turned, it appeared reddish instead of black. The light barely reached the back of the house because of the big trees, but it cast just enough light so I could get a glimpse of the color. I didn't know what to look for then, but I remember it vividly. The head was somewhat conical, and the absence of a neck made me think of a woman with long hair flowing down her shoulders. It must have been four feet wide at the shoulders because the archway over the gate was about three feet wide. 
and he was half again as wide as the gate. I could see it blink from time to time, though I couldn't make out its face. I got a brief glimpse when it turned, and it had a flat face, but beyond that I couldn't see. The eyes appeared to be an amber color, but I could be mistaken. I was just a kid, and I was trying to take it all in, but it was pretty shocking. I didn't sleep that night, and as soon as it was light, my sister and I crept out to see if it was still around. At the back of the fence where it stood, there were huge tracks. We saw where it had walked away down the cow path toward the field. I ran down to the field and the tracks turned and disappeared into the woods. We both put our feet next to the tracks and they were at least four times as long as mine and very wide. They looked like giant barefoot man tracks to us. We didn't know anything about Sasquatch. I was eight years old, but I will remember it until the day I die. When we ran back and got our mom to look at the track, she looked at them and went to the barn. She brought a garden rake out and obliterated all of the tracks that she could find. I never knew why, except that both of my parents came from superstitious hillbilly stock, and I guess it was too much for her. She made us both swear to never tell anyone else about any of it. She told our dad that she thought someone had been messing around the house. I don't know if she ever told him the truth or not. I just wish it had happened recently because I would have been prepared. That incident started my lifelong fascination with the big guy. It was 25 years before we talked about it, and then only because my baby sister had never heard the story, having been born the next year, after we moved to New Mexico permanently. I didn't get any sense that it was aggressive or dangerous in any way, and there was no smell. The main impression I had from it then, and still do, is curiosity. Thinking about it over the years, I formed my own theory. When we had rented the house, the man said that it had been empty for several years. I figured it was just curious to check out the new neighbors. Now that I know more, I realized that we had heard wood knocks frequently in Arkansas. We eventually moved to New Mexico, but my grandparents would move back and forth between Oklahoma and Arkansas. I'm a chronic insomniac. I always have been, and when we would visit on vacation, my nights in the summertime usually consisted of listening to the sounds of the night while everyone else slept. I heard wood knocks near Clinton, Fort Smith, Paris, Cecil, over in Arkansas over the years. Many times my cousins would hear them too. Nobody knew what they were, and I never connected it to the big hairy guy that I saw. As I got older, I would prod my relatives for any tidbits I could get out of them about the strange things in the woods, and I got lucky a couple of times. My grandmother told me of an incident when my uncle was also working in the oil field and worked at nights. They also lived in the country, usually in the boonies. My aunt and three cousins were home alone, and something screamed several times over the course of a couple of hours. I don't know exactly when this was, but it would have been in the 1960s. Later that night, the dog started raising hell, and there was a terrible commotion, and whatever it was chased the dog around the house and caught it. They never found a trace of the dog, but she said my uncle found huge tracks where it had been chasing the dog, and long and dark hair on two corners of the house where it had scraped the corner going around it. My uncle was six feet tall, and he had to stand on a chair to retrieve the hair. Of course, nothing was done about it, and it was never reported. Another instance is when someone my grandparents knew surprised one in a field at night while investigating a commotion with his cattle. It stood upright in front of him, and he ran for his life, never going out after dark alone again. Both of these instances occurred in Oklahoma, probably in Cato or Grady counties. I'm sorry this is so long. I don't get to talk to anyone about this stuff very often. I will leave it there, and I hope you find this worthy of narrating on your channel. Yes, I found it worthy of narrating. Most encounters are extremely interesting, and this is one that is not necessarily action-packed, but it's full of information that I think people would be interested in hearing. Thanks, DR, for sending this in. This is a great encounter.
My encounter happened in 2003. I had always been open-minded enough to believe things were out there that others didn't believe in, but I didn't actively look for or expect to see anything. We had moved to East Texas from Dallas. I have three sons, and they were new to country living. My oldest son was 15. The younger two were 11 and 12. Where we lived, there were acres and acres of blackberries, and we were maybe a mile from the Sabine River bottoms and five miles from any main highway. We were in the boonies. The property we lived on was three and a half acres, and half of it was cleared while the other half was wooded, and the woods continued beyond that. At the back of the cleared part of the yard, there was a hen house. There's also a spring-fed pond not far from the hen house. Sometime in June or July, my oldest boy was looking out the window on the back door. This is about 1 a.m. That door is next to my bedroom, and he liked watching the bats eat the bugs around the light in the yard. So when he started saying, Mom, there's a hobo in the hen house, I thought he was trying to get me up so he could snag a cigarette. And I said, boy, get your butt in the bed. There's no hobo out there. He was adamant and started giving me a play-by-play of what he was seeing. He said it ducked to get in the hen house. The door is about six and a half feet tall. And then it backed out and went around the hen house back into the woods. He said the hobo had a furry coat on and he reminded him of Chewbacca from Star Wars. I'm still in bed thinking that he is so full of crap and I didn't believe him. I asked if he was gone and the son said yes and then I told him to go get in the bed. I really did not believe him. So if you fast forward about two weeks and we're walking around the pond and I see a huge bear footprint. I told my boys that this thing is huge and maybe there is a hobo in the woods and I sort of felt bad for not believing my son. Remember, we are from a big city. A hobo would be his first thought. I didn't think anything else about this print. It had been raining, and the print really stood out in the mud by the pond. The next day, me and my oldest two sons were going to pick some blackberries, and our six-week-old German shepherd was with us. She immediately started acting weird. She grabbed my pants leg and started whining while she's trying to drag me back home. She would go from one of us to the other, acting the same way. My oldest son said that we should go home because the dog didn't like something back there. I told him that she was fine. I still had my thoughts on some blackberry jam and didn't want to go home without enough blackberries to make it with. We got to the end of the first trail and turned around to head back home. The dog was still acting weird the whole time. We weren't very far from the trail heading home, and we see a massive blackberry bush. I'm about five foot two on my tippy toes, and I couldn't reach the top of this thing. The boys and the dog stayed on the trail while I worked my way into the middle of this bush, which was a very painful task. I could still see them on the trail because of how I came in. I wasn't there two minutes when my oldest son said, Mom, there's something in that bush behind you, and it's watching us. He said it quietly, and when I turned to look, I yelled at them to run. They took off, and I'm falling everywhere trying to get out of this bush. Finally, I got out of the briar patch and ran home, still holding my blackberries. I don't know how I managed to get out of that thing. I only saw the eyes. They were black, black as coal. The eyebrows weren't so much eyebrows as a ridge. That's all I took in before I yelled at the boys and turned to run myself. When I yelled at them, that thing screamed a god-awful scream that shook my insides. The horses in the pasture were spooked and they had gone crazy. Once I got home, I realized this thing could have easily grabbed me. But it was in the bushes and they were so thick and it was hiding behind them. The only part of it that wasn't hidden was his eyes. But I couldn't tell you the shape of the head. I saw it and we fled. I think it was watching us. At home, my oldest son said that I made it mad and I needed to give it the blackberries back. I didn't give any blackberries back. I eventually made my jam. I did take some tomatoes out for it and put them near where we saw it. We were initially terrified, but after a while, not so much. We never heard a thing, never smelled anything, but the dog knew something was out there. We stayed out east for a couple of years, but eventually we moved back to Dallas. 
Thanks, Rebecca. That's a great story. I, I can imagine you guys being scared to death after seeing this thing so close. I really appreciate your courage in, in uh, talking about this thing. It's I think it's really cool. Thank you. Okay, that'll wrap up this episode. I really appreciate everyone watching, and we will see you on the next video. Thank you.